Okay, so we want to talk a little bit about a very important legal case that I think everyone here should be concerned about. And the legal case is officially titled Love versus the United States because it's about a British computer scientist and Occupy activist called Laurie Love, who you did see in the screen, but now it's gone, there you go, who... <laughs> So Jake and I have been friends of Laurie for quite a while, and at the moment he's facing some very serious allegations from the United States where the FBI is trying to extradite him to face charges under the Computer, under, under the computer Fraud and Abuse Act, where he could potentially be facing up to 99 years in jail. He's being accused of essentially taking part in a series of online protests called Operation Last Resort that followed the persecution and death of Aaron Swartz, wherein a, the website of the United States Sentencing Commission was hacked and replaced with a homepage that allowed visitors to play a game where they could control a missile-enabled Nyan cat that allowed them to shoot chunks of text off the page. And <laughs> so, so Laurie was a longtime friend of Aaron, and in fact, I first met Laurie in an IRC channel set up by Aaron 15 years ago. Laurie is currently being pursued by the U so Laurie is currently being pursued by the US criminal justice system for for effectively protesting um, abuses of the same system, and there's protesters in three separate US uh, court districts accusing him of hacking into various governmental agencies, including NASA, the US Army, the Federal Reserve, and also the Environmental Protection Agency. And as a result of all of this, Laurie was arrested in October 2013 by the National Crime Agency, which is like the UK's equivalent to the FBI. And nine months after that, his police bail was allowed to expire and he wasn't charged with anything because the National Crime Agency couldn't find any evidence of what the FBI was accusing him of. And of course, the FBI wasn't too happy about this because they were quite keen to press charges. So the FBI put in an extradition request and not just one extradition request, but three separate extradition requests from three separate districts. And this is actually just one of the ways that the FBI can abuse the justice system in order to coerce defendants to enter a guilty plea, even if they're, not, even if they're innocent. So Laurie's case actually has a pretty interesting political significance here, because his case is essentially a deja vu of another case that happened 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the FBI also tried to extradite another man called Gary McKinnon, who was accused of hacking NASA. So what happened to Gary? He fought an extradition battle for 10 years. And this raised a lot of interesting political questions in Parliament, because it revealed that the UK-US extradition, tre extradition treaty was quite unbalanced, as in, it's very one-sided to the US. It's much easier for a British, for the U.S. to extradite a U.S. for the U.S. to extradite a U.K. person than it is for the U.K. to extradite a U.S. person, and the reason for that is because for the U.S. to put an extradition request, they don't even have to show any evidence or even present the case, which is pretty insane because you'd think that the basic right to um, a fair trial includes the ability for a defendant to be able to view the case against them so that they can formulate a defence. And the British Parliament also agreed that this was unfair. So they campaigned on behalf of Gary to change the law. And eventually, Theresa May, which was the Home Secretary at the time, blocked Gary's extradition on the basis that it would be a human rights violation. Because Gary suffered, had, had a long undocumented history of depression and anxiety through his whole life. And he was also diagnosed with Asperger's. So sending him to a US prison instead of a UK prison would have been inhumane because essentially it would have um, put him away from his family and the support system that essentially sustained him. And like Gary, Laurie also has a long undocumented history of depression and is also diagnosed with Asperger's. So this case really is a deja vu of a case that happened 10 years ago. So after Gary's case, the law changed and Theresa May introduced a new piece of legislation called the Forum Bar. And the Forum Bar was designed to prevent cases like Gary's from happening ever again, like it is now. And it created, um, it essentially allowed the courts to block an extradition on the basis that um, 
the, the case can be heard in the UK and doesn't have to be heard in the US, which is the case, as Jake will be talking about in, in a while, because we, we were persecuted in the UK, even though we were accused of hacking into a whole bunch of stuff in the US. So there's no reason why Lori can't be tried in the UK. But unfortunately, a few weeks ago, the magistrate's court in the UK actually approved Laurie's extradition, but it's not over because um, there's still, um, there will still be appeals and, and this will at least go on for another two years. And the reason why um, they, they were able to accept it in this case, because after, after the foreign bar was introduced, the ability for the Home Secretary to block an extradition on human rights basis was transferred to the courts instead of the Home Secretary. So the Home Secretary no longer has the power to do what she did in Gary's case. Now the interesting thing about this case is that the judge in the case actually accepted that Laurie presents, as, in her own words, a severe, substantial, and high risk of suicide. But she didn't, she didn't accept that the US prison systems don't have adequate healthcare to deal with this, which is ridiculous because the US prison systems are notorious worldwide for the way that they treat people with mental health issues. So just as an example, Chelsea Manning was in the news a few months ago for her suicide attempt. And what did the prison do? Did they give her care? No, instead they disciplined her and sentenced her to solitary confinement because she, committed, she attempted suicide. In the UK, the exact opposite would happen. If you had mental health issues, you would be given more freedoms in your cell and, um, and access to care rather than simply being locked away in solitary confinement. Now, there's been a lot of campaigning work done for Laurie by Naomi and the Courage Foundation, which has been doing some really incredible work. And thanks to their work, we have 114 members of parliament on our side who have co-signed a letter to Barack Obama requesting him to um, reconsider Laurie's extradition. Also, Laurie's case was brought up in Parliament during Prime Minister's Question Time, which is a pretty great achievement, and I'm going to play the video now. A young man with Asperger's syndrome awaits extradition to the United States facing charges of uh, computer hacking, and is then likely to kill himself. It sounds familiar. Uh, he's not, of course, Gary McKinnon, who was saved by the Prime Minister, but Lowry Love, who faces, in effect, a death sentence. So when the Prime Minister introduced the Forum Bar to, in her words, provide greater safeguards for individuals, <coughs> surely she expected it to protect the vulnerable, like Gary McKinnon, like Lowry Love. Yeah. The Honourable Gentleman, my Honourable Friend, obviously campaigned long and hard for Gary McKinnon, and obviously I took that decision, because at that time it was a decision for the Home Secretary to decide whether there was a human rights case for an individual not to be extradited. We subsequently changed the legal position on that, so this is now a matter for the courts. There are certain parameters that the courts look at in terms of the extradition decision, and that is then passed to the Home Secretary, but it is for the courts to determine the human rights aspects of, uh, of any case that comes forward. It was right, I think, to uh, introduce uh, the uh, form bar to make sure that there was that challenge for cases here in the United Kingdom as to whether they should be held here in the United Kingdom. But the legal process is very clear, and the Home Secretary is part of that legal process. Lennon Coker. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's pretty much a non-answer, but at least it was brought up. Um, now, the reason why I'm personally so invested in this case well, for a start, I believe that it's really important for our community to have solidarity with technologists and activists who are facing injustices. But also, um, five years ago, there was a lot less support organizations supporting whistleblowers and hackers. If you were charged with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, there weren't that many places that you could turn to to get support. And there's this case that, there's one case that's really close to my heart that I want everyone to know about because it's been completely forgotten and I think we've completely failed this person. So in, in 2012, an AT&T employee called Lance Moore committed suicide after he was charged by the FBI for leaking some documents that he had access to from AT&T. And he leaked these documents via Anonymous. Now, despite the fact that there was no hacking involved and he was leaking information that he had access to, the FBI charged him for hacking AT&T which sets a pretty bad precedent 
for whistleblowers leaking information that they already had access to. Now, at that time, the, sol the solidarity community for hackers and whistleblowers was a lot smaller. The Courage Foundation didn't exist, and there wasn't really like a, no one reached out to him, and there was no like natural place for him to reach out to. But what really gets me about this case is that in hindsight, he would have actually eventually not have been, have been found not guilty, because the FBI also persecuted prosecuted one other person, Weave, for hacking AT&T, and he was eventually acquitted in 2014 because the FBI didn't have a case against him because of technicalities. Now, the, the exact same thing probably would have happened to Lance because the details of the case are, are very similar, but sadly, he never lived to be able to see this. And sadly, Lance Moore was completely forgotten and there's been no mentions or, and no news articles about him whatsoever. And that's why I think it's really important for us to build a loud and visible solidarity movement for hackers and whistleblowers so that if anyone finds themselves in trouble in the future, they will always know that they will have someone that, to look out for them. I'm going to hand it over to Naomi from the Courage Foundation, who's going to talk a little bit about the importance of Laurie's case. Thank you for that. Um, you're normally asked to care about hacker prosecution cases because here is um, someone who's really great that a really horrible thing is happening to, and we, it's right and proper that we should care when horrible things are happening to great people. Lowry is a great person, and everybody who uses encryption in the United Kingdom owes him a debt of gratitude for defeating the National Crime Agency in court earlier this year. The NCA were putting forward the novel legal theory that any, effectively no one had a right to property that law enforcement could not then read, um, which thanks to Lowry was, was, turn, was turned back and so we avoided a, a disaster there. Victories for privacy rights are vanishingly rare in the UK and that was an important one. Solidarity is an unambiguously good thing and Lowry definitely deserves your solidarity, but this case is also more important than you think. Um, I want to explain why everybody in this room should care about Lowry's case, not just because it's the right thing to do and you should be generous, but because of your out of your self-interest as well. There are several grand narratives in the hacker community that come up again and again at Congress. One of those which I think we've heard a lot about in recent years, um, probably with misplaced optimism in my opinion, is of the hacking community's battle with surveillance and for privacy rights. And um, I'm sure a lot of us remember Rob Congripe's talk about a decade ago when he said that we lost the war, meaning the war on mass surveillance. And I think we're all far too familiar with another war, and that is the war on hackers and hacking by law enforcement. That is a war where the creative approach to and use of systems is marginalized and pathologized as criminal by governments and law enforcement agencies, and the net word hacker itself is used to mean something cruel and dangerous. It's a war that disproportionately affects the, neuro the neurodivergent. So it's a war not just on what people do, and not just on what people think, but also how they think. I'm afraid to say that I think we're at risk of losing that war too, and Lowry's case is absolutely pivotal to that. If we don't manage to keep Lowry in the United Kingdom, and a transnational extradition regime is established, that means that all hackers, well, anyone who does anything interesting with computers, is potentially subject to the laws and penalties of the worst legal regime of the lot, regardless of where they live. And that legal regime is, of course, the United States. We all know how bad the criminal justice system is in, we all know that the criminal justice system in the United States is bad. Maybe we forget sometimes just how bad it is. Um, the United States has the highest per capita prison, prison population in the world. And tonight, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people are spending their, you know, their time in solitary confinement. Over 90% of defendants in the United States are coerced into pleading guilty with the threat of ridiculous sentences. I'm not, I, I wonder sometimes how we can talk about fair trials when the reality is that a vanishingly small number of people ever receive a trial at all. Lowry is almost uniquely facing charges in three separate US court districts, um, which amount to a potential sentence of some 99 years. That's 99 years for alleged acts of political speech that pertain to the actions of US prosecutors. So US prosecutors are now trying to absolutely crush Lowry Love. It's not subtle. The situation in the United States is not going away for Larry or for anyone. I, th I find it kind of difficult to um, imagine a moment which had been more propitious for reform of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act than Aaron Swartz's death. Um, and although the shockwaves are heard, were heard across the world and um, 
representations were made in Congress, nothing happened. Uh, I think we should write off legal reform in the United States as, as a possibility in the near term. <clears throat> The CFFA, as many of us know, gives prosecutors extremely wide discretion. US prosecutors collect hacker skins as trophies, and that's because they're career-making prosecutions. And if we do allow transnational jurisdictions in these kind of cases to become a regular thing, everybody here is, potentially, extraditable to the US on the whim of an American prosecutor who wants to build their career and risks no consequences for making allegations that don't stack up. Remember that the US does not have to present any evidence to extradite Lowry. The entire court proceeding in Lowry's extradition case is taking place on the basis of allegations only. No evidence is ever presented. This is a whim-based justice system. And even if you thought a whim-based justice system was just about okay under a philosopher king like Barack Obama, although if you do think that, we might have to have words later, um, how do you think that's going to work under Donald Trump's Department of Justice? I'll just leave that one hanging for a second. And as Mustafa explained, we've had a close escape with this kind of thing before. Gary McKinnon was the, was the test case for the bilateral extradition treaty between the UK and the US, and that concluded computer crimes just because the US was unhappy about how the UK had handled a couple of hacker prosecutions in the 1990s. That's all it is. So after securing the law, US prosecutors tried to establish the precedent with Gary. They failed, but only just, and it took a 10-year battle of, you know, almost unparalleled ferocity to stop it. A subsequent change in the law, which I'm going to insist on calling Theresa May's forum bar, was supposed to prevent cases like this ever happening again. And it forms the immediate context of Larry Love's legal defense in the United Kingdom. But in September, at Westminster Magistrates Court, it fell at the first hurdle. We're now waiting to, to hear whether an appeal will be allowed to go ahead. And if, if it is, we can expect that to happen towards the middle of next year. We really need to keep Larry in the UK because the precedent of his extradition will not easily be turned back. As Brexit Britain is about to find out, transnational legal regimes are very hard to turn back once established. A new transnational regime about, of, about America's global jurisdiction over the internet and the regime of criminal law as it pertains to hackers is going to be similarly difficult to extricate ourselves from if it's allowed to be built. And that is why this case is more important than you think. And its outcome has the potential to affect everybody in this room and will have far-reaching implications which you are going to find it very difficult to reverse in the future. <clears throat> so I'm calling on everybody here and everybody who's watching on the live stream to please, if not out of solidarity with Larry, who incidentally is a wonderful person who you should feel solidarity with and he deserves your support, if not out of solidarity with Larry, then please just think of yourself and your comrades and your community and please help us save Larry. Because if we don't save Larry, we will not be able to save ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Jake now. Hi. Um, this is working. Uh, I'm going to speak just very briefly before we get Larry on himself. A little bit about extradition and then a sort of pretentious statement about how great Larry is. Um, so, Mustafa, the first time Mustafa and I met in real life was in the dock uh, of court, having both been arrested for involvement in Anonymous and LOLSEC. And the only reason we're able to sit here today uh, next to each other is we weren't extradited to the United States, even though at one point um, there was talk of it. We were prosecuted, sentenced in the UK. Um, must have received a two-year suspended prison sentence, I received a two-year prison sentence. Um, though, if extradition had been sought, um, and it had been successful, I'm sure we'd still be unable to do the things we do today. We'd be locked in a, a very tiny cell. Um, but now we're, I suppose, functional members of society, paying taxes and the like. Um, and Larry should be able to have the same the opportunity to be, to, be, to be tried in the country in which he lives, in which he was arrested and where his loved one lives. So, said pretentious statement about Larry. So I, I do, I vividly remember the first time I met Larry Love, uh, 2014. It was in the middle of the busy London King's Cross train station, and he introduced himself by way of wheeling into the back of my legs with a giant boombox trolley system that was blasting a reggae jungle playlist. We were meeting as a group of security researchers and ex-hackers. Some of us knew each other online and we were meeting for the first time 
in the real world. For the previous 12 months, between 2013 and 2014, I had been legally banned from speaking to anyone in Anonymous, which was difficult to moderate on the basis that everyone and no one is anonymous, apparently. So that was a fun year. But it was fascinating and terrifying prospect then to meet people in the real world um, that, had, that we had just known online. Larry, being there, he, he provided an enthusiasm and an energy that, and, and it, which was immediately contagious. Um, and I, I learned that he, he has the look and demeanor of, of someone who's always thinking of the well-being and happiness of others around him. And simultaneously, you may have caught a glimpse of it in the live stream, he has this sort of subtle glimmer that suggests he's in on a very funny joke that no one else can ever hope to conceive of. Um, but he can also consume pints of beer at a staggeringly impressive rate. You may have seen some of that going down in the stream. Um, so we, the last time I met Larry, uh, the second, this is the second time, so I was at this conference two years ago, 31C3. Um, and if you talk to him even briefly, um, I'm sure you'll remember him in the conversation. He has the ability to just effortlessly span so many different genres of information security. Weaving, you know, he weaves inconceivably fascinating politics, philosophy, uh, comedy, and complex technical concept into these beautifully crafted and highly memorable advice and ideas. And he collaborated with so many people here two years ago that I, I thought there, was, there wasn't one but ten Larrys just off in all parts of the center dispensing wisdom to everyone. An absolutely remarkable, remarkable person um, and really brought a sense of joy here. Um, and that joy spreading continued at around 3 a.m. when he and I and Mustafa and several others got lost on the streets of Hamburg trying to find our way back to our hostel. Um, <laughs> And he, he inspired us endlessly throughout our stay. And it's, it's, it's depressing to, that such an absurd situation it means he can't be here today um, with us. And what I've, what I've learned since then, since hanging out with Larry and being around him in so many different types of situation from you know, being completely out of our minds at festivals to sitting down with members of the UK government trying to convince them that our extradition relationship with the US is flawed and corrupt. Um, and you heard from most of his video there. To watching Larry sit in a court dock as prosecutors berated him, um, sitting making origami, beautiful origami as a coping mechanism. I've learned through all of this that Larry is, he, he, he is Larry. He, he has a, oh, there we go. This is not printed correctly. It's printed. Rem this is actually printed backwards. <laughs> how is how have words printed backwards? Mustafa, is this you? No, it's not. Like I started reading the next sentence. I began reading, and it's literally backwards. I don't have to read it in reverse. Um, I've been my paper's been hacked. Oh <laughs> no, that's okay. Well done, whoever hacked my paper. No, it's fine. It looks fine. Look, that's fine. That bit's fine. Yeah, just read. Yeah. Just read that bit. <laughs> well, this bit is fine as well. Yeah, it's okay. Look, look, Larry is. Um, let's just let's read it backwards. Um, Larry is open, honest, compassionate. Uh, he's uh, he's capable of adapting and making the best of any situation. And he always, always adds value to any project, idea, or social dynamic. And you know, it's, it's absurd to remove that talent from society. I mean, it's meaningless. It's completely illogical. Someone in power needs to just make the extradition request go away and give him a job, basically. You know. Because people like Larry have helped to secure things that most people would be shocked to learn were even vulnerable to begin with. Um, and he is right now, this day, helping to make the digital world a safer place for everyone. And there's a real irony to it then. Um, locking Larry away m genuinely makes it easier for the critical infrastructure of the UK and other countries to be compromised. Um, and it's ridiculous to think that any benefit can come from shipping someone away to a dark room in another country far from their loved ones. Um, Mustafa and I were dragged through the legal system for hacking. And as I say, we now contribute to society, to society in our own ways having been dealt with in the UK, our own country. Um, no extradition was formally sought for us, nor has it for countless other UK hackers, nearly every single one 
but it has been for Larry, and that seems to come from a place of vengeance more than justice. There are, and, and there are so many people that should be here right now. Jeremy Hammond, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, Barrett Brown, Larry Love, of course, and many others. And these remarkable, fiercely intelligent people don't deserve to be crammed into some tiny prison cell for years or barred from entering or leaving their own countries. And they shouldn't even be here via some dodgy video link. But they should be physically here at the conference, listening to talks, dancing in the disco lounge till 4 a.m., and uh, sitting with friends and colleagues, enjoying a, uh, a nice, cool, crisp club mate. So I'd like to, on that note, <laughs> raise a club mate to those people and others around the world that are facing the unjust wrath, wrath of the US government and its corrupt, overreaching intelligence agencies, and thank them for being brave um, and fighting, and know that we'll keep fighting for them. Thank you. And now we'll go to Larry. Club mate. Hand over to Larry. All right, Larry, you're up. Hold on, a lot of lag. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, all right, well, I'm not sure how much I, I need to. Hello? Oh, okay, I'm just getting myself into it. <laughs> okay, so I was just hearing the feedback of myself asking if you could hear me 20 seconds ago, that's fine. So um, there's not a huge amount I really need to add to that, but it was really well explained by Mustafa and Jake and Naomi, who have been fantastic in their support, and um, especially Naomi and the Courage Foundation, without whom I probably would have gone crazy uh, a while ago. Um, so, sorry, there's just a bit more noise coming up. <laughs> so, what is this about? Um, Obviously, for, for my friends and family and loved ones, they don't want to see me taken to a country that I've never been to, be locked up probably for the rest of my life if I don't die tragically of uh, violence at my own hand or the hands of somebody else, which really happens to a lot of people. Um, for the US, it's about making an example or uh, as part of their kind of long term um, persecution of. Hackers, uh, information transparency activists, uh, and subversives of all kind, but especially online. Um, I would like not to be an example, and um, I think there's better things to contribute to the world. I uh, uh, study electrical engineering, um, I do work in, in cryptography and information security. Um, I, I take an interest in politics, I take an interest in uh, civilization surviving for the next hundred years and if we're lucky a thousand years or indefinitely into the future and there's a lot that needs to be done this is not something that we can take for granted anymore um, and part of having a reasonable assurance that we will continue to thrive as a civilization is maintaining a few important things um, one of those is the internet as a free and open resource that's available to all for the mutual betterment of mankind without being dominated by uh, the interests of nation states over one another or being dominated by, by corporate profit making interests to the exclusion of um, communication, education, um, and, and cultural development. Um, another thing that we need to ensure is due process. And due process is what allows us to be that we can go about what we're doing with freedom and liberty to fight against injustice or just to enjoy the privacy of our own lives um, without powerful parties being able to step in because they don't like us for some reason um, and impose upon our liberty. For instance, in my case, um, 
that's I would expect they kidnap me and take me to, to be locked away and tortured um, without evidence being shown. Um, so the few things that, that people would like to be able to expect as part of due process, and that's when they're arrested. That um, uh, After they're arrested, they, they will be charged with, with the crimes for which they were suspected. And if not, they, they'd be allowed to, to go back uh, about their business and have their property returned. In my case, I wasn't charged, and I, I'm still lightly out through the courts uh, the return of my property. Um, and as you heard, they, uh, numerous efforts were made to compel me to um, passwords and cryptographic information, despite uh, not being charged with any offences. And since then, the, the extradition request came as an obvious principle of jurisprudence that uh, as was by Mustafa, the, the US has no obligation to make a prima facie case because of the, the one-sided extradition treaty that was uh, uh, arranged between Tony Blair and George Bush, who you may remember from other things that haven't gone so well. Um, and it's very concerning in the abstract, not just because it's my life, but in the abstract now, given who is going to be running the, the, the administration of the US government for the next four years, that somebody can be plucked from this country without a shred of evidence, without being able to see um, the evidence, without being able to contest it, only on the, the basis of, of hypothetical allegations. Um, and that there is no, there seems to be so far in the court process, no concern um, about the other issue of having bail, um, because I would be considered a flight risk because they had to kidnap me in the first place, whereas in the UK, uh, in other prosecutions, stay with your family and continue your life and have access to the information that you need to formulate a defence. So in terms of just having um, any kind of justice, as was mentioned earlier, like 19 out of 20 people will never have a trial because they will be made an offer and a plea bargain that's much more attractive than the alternative, which is having the charges stacked so that they can, in my case, make 99 years, which you know, would be the rest of my life. So it's important um, that we win this case on appeal, um, that as much pressure is brought to bear as possible, so that these systemic issues can be really looked at. Um, hopefully, through the refusal of the sexual issue, the precedent can be set that you can't just uh, pluck people up that you don't like without having to at least make a case, um, and maybe something, uh, some consideration can be made to the disproportionality of sentences under the CFAA um, for the non-violent offences. Um, and Naomi said that we, we shouldn't be too optimistic about legal reform in the US in the immediate future, um, but that should continue to agitate for it. And so if this exhibition is refused because of the systemic problems with coercive plea bargaining with, with the sentencing regime, the, the mandatory sentencing guidelines, which uh, allow the, the charges to stack up in such a ludicrous way, then it gives some ammunition to the people that in a, in a distant future, if we get out, if we, if we manage to crash it, um, then things will eventually have to be fixed. Just plug myself back in, so I can see if you've heard anything I've said. But I, I really thank people for taking an interest in the case. Um, I, I know that I won't go to the United States uh, simply because I. surrendered the sovereignty over my own life or my autonomy at will. Um, however, the people that are trying to take me there have uh, theoretically the minimum right to use violence, which I would probably not, not raise to that level. Um, and so my, my options for not surrendering that sovereignty may become um, and I can't actually discuss them because that would be another excuse for them to, to lock me up. Um, but the, there will be no direction no issue. Um, afterwards, there will be some resolution of the issues of the case. Uh, but for that to happen, it's for us to win the appeal uh, and to, to go through the process rather than, than having to resort to, to other means to, to avoid the, the fate that I cannot allow to happen. Um, thank you very much to the people on the panel, and I guess questions. OK, 
Okay, let's open it up to Q and A's. We have about eight microphones in the room, and we also have a lovely signal angel that will be taking questions from the internet. So please, if you have any questions, Laurie, don't be shy. Get up to the microphones and speak loud and clear. Otherwise, do you have anything from the panel that you want to say in response to what Laurie was just saying? Microphone number three, please. It's more like a, not a question, but a comment. I mean, um, I, I'm, I, I, I kind of understand the, uh, Lauri situation because uh, I both have Asperger's and uh, have uh, had um, issues with the law. No, uh, but but I, I am not yet uh, uh, wanted by the US government, uh, luckily. But uh, may, maybe it will change if, we, if I um, do some things and visit conferences like this. So. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from microphone number four, and please, mostly questions and not so much comments. One comment, one comment though. It seems that the internet in the UK is still the way it has always been. <laughs> uh, so, Jake, um, could you could you possibly make a few comments uh, about resemblances and what can be applied from your case in Laurie's case? I mean, I think it would be very interesting for everybody to know your story as to how much time did you actually do and why and what from that should Laurie be actually kept in the UK? What from your story can be applied to his case if, you know, God help, he's going to stay there? Yeah, sure. So a very brief timeline of uh, arrest through to release. Um, Mustafa and I were both arrested in 2011. They were, we were both then banned from the internet for two years as part of police bail. Very interesting times. 2013, we were uh, also we were on home detention with a big electronic tag around our ankles. Um, 2013, we were sentenced uh, at Southwark Crown Court. I received a two-year prison sentence, though of the amount of time spent on an electronic tag, the way we work in the UK is we do half of the time in prison and half of the time on probation. Um, mathematically speaking, because of two years on tag, I served maybe uh, six, or, six or seven weeks in a, in a prison. Um, must have received a suspended sentence. We then both did a, a year of probation. And that year I was banned from speaking to anyone from Anonymous. Uh, currently, we're both still under an order called a serious crime prevention order, which means we can't encrypt our files or delete internet history and a bunch of other little things. So when I came to this, when we, well, both of us, when we both came to this conference, we had to declare that we were getting a flight out and a flight back, and that will be enforced until 2018. Um, that all put together sounds pretty ridiculous as a, as a case, but it's far saner than anything that would occur if we were sent to the States. It would be far simpler if we were sent to the States. We'd just be put in a cell for a very, very long time. And it's complicated in the UK, it's messy, but our parole system is reasonable, our legal system is reasonable, and uh, in terms of similarities with alleged crimes, um, we were alleged to have broken into US government computers as well. Um, and it... It, it, us and about 20 other cases were dealt with successfully here in a number of ways. There's so much um, paperwork out there now for judges and prosecutors to make informed decisions that it clearly works better for hackers to be dealt with in their own country rather than be sent to a, a jurisdiction that puts them away for decades at a time. So there's similarities to draw on um, at all levels and it's ridiculous that uh, they've chosen to take this, as I say, vengeful approach. So the, so the uh, targets that we were actually we hacked were pretty much all in the US, and yet we were still tried in the UK because the evidence was presented in the UK court. So I, abs I see absolutely no reason why, you, why Laurie can't be tried in the UK and why the evidence can't be seen in the UK. Even mo most of the evidence in our case actually came from the US, mostly from Hector Monsegur, who was an FBI informant. The UK, our, um, UK um, police officers actually hopped on a plane to the US and brought the evidence back in a CD-ROM. So I don't see why Laurie has to be extradited when all the evidence can be transferred to the UK. There's a big question in this case about whether there has been a good faith attempt to, to prosecute Laurie in the UK. That's um, a big question which still has to be tackled in the UK and hopefully um, 
we'll get a bit closer towards doing that before the appeal happens. Um, it's probably worth noting that, um, as you've heard, Lowry's um, maximum potential sentence in the United States is 99 years. The equivalent, if you were prosecuted in the UK, is a maximum of about two and a half years, of which no one I've spoken to thinks he would actually serve that maximum. So the differential is pretty shocking. We have one question from the internet. Actually, there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, what are some of the most effective things that hackers can do to resist the mistreatment of hackers as activists? Maybe me. My question. Um, so, raising awareness of these cases is incredibly important. In particular cases like Lowry's, where there is a very knotty political, national political issue at play, then getting in touch with your elected representatives is, is very useful. Um, in Lowry's case, actually two things we could do with in Lowry's case. Um, we could do with more, you know, more influential people coming forward and explaining, ex you know, exactly why extraditing Lowry would be an astonishingly bad idea. Um, everybody in this audience probably knows, at least knows somebody who knows somebody who would be useful to speak out about that. So get talking to people you know. The other one is that, um, as was mentioned right at the beginning in the introduction, Lowry is not just a British citizen, he also holds Finnish citizenship. And we could do with a bit of pressure in Finland to get the Finnish government to um, say something publicly about Lowry's case. Probably only would take a little push, in my opinion. So that those are some concrete things that could happen. Oh, and one thing I should mention, um, we also have a defense fund for Lowry. Should, God forbid, he end up in the United States, the costs are going to get very serious very quickly. So um, if you go to freelowry.com slash donate and um, send some money, it would be very appreciated. We have a question from microphone number one. Uh, I know you said no more comments, but I have a, I have a comment. Um, uh, I'm Noah Swartz. I'm Aaron Swartz's brother, uh, who was mentioned a lot during this talk. Uh, and one of the things that happened during Aaron's prosecution was that the prosecutor, Steve Hyman, tried very hard to prevent uh, anyone from raising awareness about Aaron's case or Aaron getting any sort of support from people like us, the hacker community, or any other people that knew him. Uh, and then after, you know, he died, a lot of people said, you know, like, why didn't we do anything? Why didn't people stand up for Aaron when we had the chance? Uh, so here you go. You have the chance now to support Laurie. Um, don't waste it. Thank you, Noah, for everything you've done. We'll take one more question from the internet. <laughs> we got Laurie back on the screen now. Apparently, apparently he's too distracting to be put on the screen, is what they said. <laughs> Let's keep him on the screen, it doesn't matter. This is, this is his talk, so he should be on the screen. I think he should be on the screen. We'll take one question from the internet if the signal ray angel is ready. And yes. please get up to the microphones if you have questions here in the room. Yeah, uh, is there anything we can do within the US legal system to stop this or is it essentially up to public pressure or legislatory, the executive, to drop the case? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's been a lot of campaigning in the UK, but it would, really, it would be really great to see some campaigning in the US. Um, I think it would be quite worthwhile to contact your congressmen and senators about this case because we've ha we've ha we, ha we have our MPs, um, we have about a fifth of our government sign signing a letter to Barack Obama, but we have nothing on the U.S. side. So I think it would be really powerful for the, for um, people in the U.S. or politicians in the U.S. to also try and do something because otherwise it will just seem like it's, it's um, the U.S. is carrying to U.K. demands. Yeah, I, I would second that. We need a lot more noise about this in the United States, in my opinion. I think for um, elsewhere in the EU, of course, Finland is a particular case here, but I think an awareness that, um, you know, it's not just hackers in the UK who are indicted in the, in, in the US and manage, manage to stay here. This is a situation which happens all across the European Union, and one of the dangers of Lowry's case is that should he be extradited, God forbid, then it's going to open the floodgates elsewhere in the EU as well. So there really needs to be a proper rearguard action 
all over the place to stop the US asserting yeah, extraterritorial jurisdiction over these kinds of issues. We have more questions from the internet. No more questions. Do any of you have any more questions in the room? Now is your time to shine. Come up to the microphones. If not, do we have any final comments from the three of you on the panel? Uh, microphone so just, number one. Yeah, the, just to play, you know, devil's advocate, kind of. Uh, so you're saying it's mainly about vengeance, the extradition, but what about the argument that well? So you said there were 20 cases that were handled without extradition. And I'm guessing the sentences were pretty uh, lenient. So maybe from the US perspective, okay, these guys are hacking into our computers from Europe. Their governments are giving them pretty lenient sentences because from the government's point of view, I don't want it the political heat of putting some geeky guy in prison who's you know, not some thug that's uh, so. So, so when you say lenient, you no, no, I mean lenient in comparison to the sorry? U.S. government. So when you say lenient, you do realize that the U.S. government, the U in the U.S., has the harsher sentencing um, laws possible. Germany. No, no, that, that's what I'm saying. That yeah. you're saying, oh, maybe yeah. the U.S. is concerned that if this, you know, becomes the norm that uh, these crimes, there is no extradition, and the. The local governments will also, also always their incentive will be to give a very lenient sentence. Mm. I think they probably do think something along those lines, but on on the basis that they think that other sentences are lenient, I mean they're not that lenient. Um, Mr. Fanaya under restrictions until 2018. Our case began in 2011. As if you face anything up, put anything up against the kind of punishments in the the U.S. throughout um, Chelsea, etc. It's the U.S. security. I mean, like what? I'm sorry. What what kind of thing did you do? Did you do something that hurts U.S. security? Yeah, we were alleged to have hurt U.S. security, and I'm uh, indicted in the United States in New York, though no extradition was sought. Yeah, our case is pretty severe, like Laurie's. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. We have we one more question from the internet. Yeah, someone on the on the IRC tells me the lawyer wants to say again uh, something. Is it possible to give a word to him? Whatever it is, it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's possible if the connectivity wants to play along. Yeah. Laurie? Sorry. If it fails, we can, you can type it on IRC and yeah. we can. Uh, there's a five second delay. <laughs> Or something like that. Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. I think he has the mic. I'll, I'll tell you what hurts US security. We can hear you. Please do speak. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say um, US security would, would be helped by um, the improving the security, um, which means uh, fixing the engineering problem of, of insecure services and products and infrastructure. That's not especially furthered by, by punitive responses to people that make them aware of those security problems. Obviously, there's a need to enforce the law, um, but um, prioritizing political acts rather than um, taking advantage of the information to, to fix the actual underlying problems is probably not the best strategy going forward. <laughs>
I think I'll ask uh, Naomi from the Courage Foundation to try and remind us what we could all be doing to help um, Laurie and also future cases if we get them. Sure, so what, what can you do to help Lowry? Um, if you're in the UK and your MP did not sign the letter to Obama saying that Lowry's extradition would be a bad thing and he should be prosecuted in the UK, then you should, you know, if there's evidence, then you um, should certainly write, you should certainly write to them and ask them why they haven't signed. And if they have signed, you should, you should write to them and say thank you for signing and please keep an eye on this as it goes forward. Um, <clears throat> Further than that, it's really important to um, just make sure that people are aware of this case. I think the internet is pretty much aware of this of this case, but there's a whole world beyond the internet. Some of some of whom you know, and some of whom you can speak to in person, and that's um, that's very valuable. Um, beyond beyond the UK, as I've said, we really need to raise the pressure on this in the United States. Having some influential people in the United States coming forward and saying that this is a bad thing that should not be allowed to happen would be very would be very useful. If you're in Finland, then putting then putting pressure on Finnish representatives would also be su super useful. Um, and beyond that, there's the, there's a defence fund that you know. With the Defence Fund, we've been able to make sure that um, Lowry had the maximum number of expert witnesses possible at his extradition hearing, and as we go further, the cost implications could be quite serious, so that makes a massive difference. Um, just keep an eye on what is going on, um, you know, follow the Courage Foundation, follow, follow Lowry's Twitter, and um, yeah, I imagine that there'll be further concrete things to do as we move on into the next year. Good, and we have a couple of more final questions. Uh, comments. Um, well, one last thing. If you want to talk to Laurie, um, we're going to be hosting a one-hour Q&A session in the tea house on the fourth floor. Uh, well, the live stream will continue. Yes, and I um, <clears throat> just wanted to thank everyone here and on the internet for supporting Larry and many cases in our case back in 2011, which means we can be here today and talk about Larry's case and we should move that forward and we should all harness that power and take the lessons we've learned so that the best outcome can be had for, for Larry. Well, thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for a great panel. And I think we should have one more round of applause also for the people that have been fighting very hard for you two to be able to be here.